Okay, for most people when you think of the Crusades, we're talking the Holy Land, not Eastern Europe. But following a papal bull by Pope Honorius III in 1217, it was exactly here that a series of military campaigns took place, which sought to forcibly Christianize the local population, starting off with the still then very pagan Prussians. Many countries, including the Holy Roman Empire, Denmark, Russia, Poland, and Lithuania would, in one way or another, come to be involved in these events. And in time, this saw the rise of the Livonian Order. Blurring the lines of what is and isn't a country, the order was, like its predecessor, the Teutonic Order, a Catholic religious and military order. It did, however, also hold territory, establish a capital of sorts, technically too, and exercise what can only be described as governmental control over the area's population, both Christian and pagan. So, if this sounds interesting to you, stay tuned, and if you just came across the channel, well, consider subscribing. It's that time again to remind people to go ahead and hit the like button. As always, I find that just asking people to do so helps our videos do a lot better. So, if you're interested in more videos like these, it's a quick thing you can do to help them out. In the 12th century, what today is known as the Baltic had, and I want to stress this, a mostly Balto-Slavic population. This included the Latgalians, Livonians, Estonians, Semigalians, Koronians, Salonians, and, last but not least, the Lithuanians. These people were pagan, in that they followed non-Abrahamic religions, much to the ire of Catholic nations, which had, already by this point, attempted to convert the area's population to Christianity. Okay, so in 1180, a Christian monk by the name of Meinhardt traveled to what is now the Latvian coast where he intended to preach among the Liv, a Finno-Ugric tribe. He aimed to do so in a peaceful manner, and therefore needed the approval of a certain Vladimir of Polosk, who seemed to be the ruler of Polosk, a Russian lesser kingdom that probably received tribute from the region where Meinhard intended to proselytize. Why so vague? Well, Vladimir is mentioned just once, and there's no account of him in Russian sources. There is also nothing written about any of these events, which is kind of strange, because the mission undoubtedly took place. Anyway, Meinhard settled along the Dagaufa River and built a small church. He was later attacked by the Lithuanians though, and following this decided to build a castle to better protect himself. These stone buildings were, allegedly, the first in the area. However, despite now being able to preach from relative safety behind the walls of his newly built castle, Meinhard's mission was not very successful, and on at least one occasion the local people attempted to forcibly drive him out of the area. Nevertheless, in 1186, he was declared Bishop of Ixkala by the Archbishop of Bremen. This was confirmed by Pope Clement III in 1188. However, a short while later, in 1196, Meinhard died. He was succeeded by Berhold of Hanover, who believed the sword a much better means of converting the still uncooperative pagans, and likely as a result of this, he died in battle in 1198. Berhold was then followed by Albert of Buxtuven, who, upon arriving with 500 crusaders in 1200, intensified militaristic operations against what he described as the treacherous Liv. Just before this, in 1199, Pope Innocent III had issued a papal bull which declared the now official crusade against the Livonians is equal to that occurring in the Holy Land. In 1201, after transferring the bishopric from Ixcala, the city of Riga was founded, with Albert by this point having taken the title of bishop. A year later, in 1202, realizing that a standing army would be more useful than multinational crusaders who rotated in and out, Albert founded the Livonian Brothers of the Sword, which was to protect the various bishoprics and aid in the conversion of pagans who still lived in the lands around the Gulf of Riga. Oh, and just a quick note, some sources list a certain Theodoric of Trident as the order's founder, but likely this is referring to the eventual Bishop of Estonia, who was appointed by Albert sometime during 1211 and 1219. Anyway, Sword Brothers, as members were known, had to be of noble birth and were required to take vows of obedience, poverty, and celibacy. The order itself consisted of three different classes, knights, priests, and serving brothers. Depending on which class a person belonged to, they had to wear clothes of a specific color. Knights, as might be expected, held a considerable amount of power, making up the order's grand assembly, which selected a grand master and other important officials. 
Pope Innocent III sanctioned the order's founding in 1204, and soon the Sword Brothers began their mission, consolidating the bishopric's control over Livonia and converting, often by the sword, much of the population. In 1207, the order was given a third of the bishopric's territory in recognition of its accomplishments, which in effect made the Livonian Brothers of the Sword a pseudo-state within a pseudo-state. This, however, sparked off a conflict between the order and the previously mentioned Albert, as the order more often than not ignored its vassalage to the bishops. Conflict between spiritual and temporal leaders was quite common in medieval Europe, but before going any further, let's talk about bishoprics for a moment. Within Livonia, sometimes called Terra Mariana in historical sources, there were three bishoprics, that of Dorpat, Asselwik, and Korland, alongside what eventually became the archbishopric of Riga. Technically speaking, these were subject to the Holy See, i.e. under jurisdiction of the Pope. The leadership of the bishoprics and archbishopric, however, were both the ecclesiastical and secular rulers of Livonia, in theory anyway. But, as mentioned, a rivalry soon emerged with the Livonian Brothers of the Sword. Ignoring Elbert, who preferred to expand southwards, members of the order ventured north into what nowadays is Estonia, going so far as to forge an alliance with the Danish king, Valdemar II. Denmark at the time was a strong regional power caught up in what seemed like a never-ending conflict with Estonian pirates. Said Estonians were also rivals to the Lethgalians, who forged an alliance with the Sword Brothers in 1208 and voluntarily offered to convert to Christianity. The Estonians, in contrast, were supported by the Russian states of Novgorod and Peskov. In 1219, Valdemar conquered northern Estonia, thereafter creating the Duchy of Estonia. An agreement was then brokered by Albert with Valdemar, in which the former recognized Danish claims to northern Estonia, whereas the south was given to the order. This agreement didn't last very long, though, and in 1227 the Sword Brothers attacked northern Estonia. However, despite this, internal and external divisions were seemingly already taking a toll upon the order. Having been rebuked for their military adventurism by Pope Honorius III, and then Gregory IX, who maintained that northern Estonia was in fact Danish territory, alongside the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, the Sword Brothers were in a difficult position, especially since the military order was still heavily dependent on these rulers in terms of economic support and manpower. So the order withdrew, only to re-enter Danish lands a short time later, and, going a step further, they even occupied some of Elbert's territory, leveling tolls on those crossing the Dalgava River likely as a means to deal with their growing financial issues. In 1236, Pope Gregory IX declared a new crusade against the Lithuanians, and the Sword Brothers enthusiastically took up this call to arms. They soon marched south, sacking villages and towns, but while heading back north through swampy terrain, they encountered a sizable force of some 4,000 to 5,000, led by Duke Vikingtas. The Battle of Sale, which followed, was a crushing defeat for the Sword Brothers and their allies, who lost 2,700 men out of a total force of 3,000, including some 48 to 60 knights. Okay, right now you're probably thinking, wait, just 48 to 60 knights? That's a pretty small number when considering a total force of about 3,000. Well, knights were not equal to soldiers. Knights were mostly landowners and fairly wealthy, something not at all common in medieval Europe. They could afford armor, weapons, and a horse, luxuries that most common soldiers couldn't even dream of. So, to have 48 or 60 of them die in a battle was a devastating loss for the Sword Brothers. What's more, Fulquin, master of the Livonian Brothers of the Sword, also died at the Battle of Sole. So, anyway, remember these guys here? They did not represent normal infantry in battles during this period. This defeat was too much for the order, and in 1237 they were forced to form the Union of Viterbo with the Teutonic Order, which controlled the region southwest of the Baltic. So the state of the Teutonic Order now, in effect, had two branches, the Prussian or Teutonic branch and the Livonian branch, which was also known as the Livonian Order. For the order, many things stayed the same after this union. Administration and territory remained separate from its Prussian counterpart. And, in contrast with the Teutonic Order, the Livonian Order maintained a clear separation between itself and the bishoprics, unlike the Prussian branch, which was more centralized in this regard. The membership of the branches also differed in that the Prussian branch was made up of noblemen from central and western parts of the Holy Roman Empire, while the Livonian branch was composed of noblemen from the northern HRE and even Denmark. 
In 1238, the Livonian Order tried conquering parts of the Novgorod Republic, a wealthy medieval Russian state. But, unfortunately, we're going to have to cover that next episode.